Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to this week's episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. Jess and Matt are joining me after a wild weekend in Iowa. Guys, how are we doing tonight? Good. I'm good. All right. This week's episode is brought to you by gripmat.com. That's G R Y P M A T.com. It is the world's first flexible non slip tool mat uh, developed by uh, an awesome Air Force mechanic. And if you use code PLP10, you get 10% off. Uh, we'll put the website link in the show notes and on our social media. Uh, glad to have them on board uh, for the foreseeable future. So, with that being said, uh, Iowa, what are your first thoughts about Iowa before we get into everything that happened this weekend? I stayed awake for it. Um, I, I thought it was really good. I thought it was, uh, it was a little bit crazy. Obviously, the weather played a large effect on the race in general, but it was, I, I enjoyed it. I had a blast with Mike and Mike, and uh, unfortunately, the rain kind of ruined our plans uh, with my parents, we had a lot of stuff to do Sunday morning that we really couldn't miss. So unfortunately we actually had to drive back once we decided that the cleanup for the track was going to take a while. So as, uh, as the pace laps were happening, I was actually sitting down on my couch in Minnesota, you know, walk through the door. So fortunately I got to catch all the race, had a blast at the track. The race itself was epic. You know, we're going to dive into a lot of it here, but yeah, yeah, overall I was really happy with what happened and super appreciative that the race got in uh, that night. Uh, thanks to a lot of efforts and all the fans who stayed around too. Yeah. So that being said, just a quick recap here at the top five again. Obviously, Joseph Newgarden won. Scott Dixon came out of nowhere and finished second. James Hinchcliffe third. Pulsiter Simon Pagino finished fourth. And Spencer Pickett finished sixth. So that puts our championship uh, positions with Rossi finishing back in sixth that he's 29 back of Mr. Newgarden. Pagino's 58 and Dixon is all the way back. Uh, 98 points back. So, lady and gentlemen, who is your driver of the day? And uh, then after we do, we go through those, we'll go through our disappointments of the day. Driver of the day for me, I guess, was Joseph Newgarden. Uh, he just did such a good job and just seems like every year at Iowa, he's susceptible to lead 200 laps or more. Uh, it's been crazy how good he's done some of those races. And I think it was somewhere around 240 this time around. So good for him. Uh, much needed win to fend off what looks like a couple of strong tracks coming up for Rossi. And um, definitely got to get a little bit of buffer now while he can. So he definitely capitalized on the most of it with Rossi having a quote unquote down weekend. I am going to go with uh, my prediction for who would do well. Um, although he finished in the same place he started, uh, Ferrucci, man, those restarts were fire, and he was passing everybody he could get the car to work. I really enjoyed watching him race. Yeah, uh, good, good pick by both of you, and uh, I'm sure we'll we'll talk about that in a minute here. I, I actually struggled who I wanted to pick did well because there's some great storylines. Piggott going 19th and finishing fifth, four day qualified 21st, finished finished ninth. Uh, Zach Veach qualified 20th, finished 7th, but I'm going to go with Tony Kanaan. He qualified 13th and finished 10th. I feel like all in all, that has to be a huge confidence boost to the entire Foyt team just to have a weekend where you know, Kanaan finishes in the top 10, qualifies relatively well. Even Mateus Lace finished 16th after qualifying 22nd. He was only two laps down, stayed out of trouble all day, didn't you know, do anything stupid, didn't have to retire the car, or, uh, you know, with handling problems. So all in all, I think it was a, a pretty good weekend for the, the Foy team for a change. Now on the other end of the spectrum, guys, who is our, who is our disappointment of the day? I'll go first. I'm going to have to say Sage got in a couple incidents, didn't really pulled himself together very well um, and, and just kind of, you know, blew a shot to to have a decent finish. I would say probably 
you know, looking at that 10th, 11th spot, um, realistically. And, and, you know, he ended up 22nd. So I definitely don't think that he, uh, showed any kind of, I don't know, potential or anything with the drive. Unfortunately. I think Ryan Hunter Ray had a pretty brutal weekend. It's kind of not that great in practice, poor qualifying, and he was lost in the race and same for another teammate of his. who I'm sure we'll touch on in a second here, but, uh, for him being a what two time winner at the track, I didn't really expect that. And if there's a driver on that team who usually has a setup down, you know, Rossi's been there the last couple of years, but as far as the whole throughout his career at Andretti Autosport, I thought Hunter has always done good at setting up a car. So for him to be that lost and to kind of finish down the order was a really surprising for me. You guys, you're going to leave me with a low hanging fruit <laughs> here. I'm just going to start off by saying, yeah, I think you're both right. Uh, I do feel bad for for Sage that uh, you know got a little, probably got a little flustered after that first spin. But uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and I usually try not to say negative things about him. But Marco Andretti, yeah, you, know, you get black flagged at a track that you've won at before. You're on the radio saying, right, "Guys, how do we keep missing the setup that bad?" I know he didn't qualify well, so it's it's not like. We were expecting a lot out of an 18th place qualifier, but I mean, guys like Bourdais and Veach started in the back and, and came up just by working hard. And I don't know if it was a setup. I know he claims uh, that he may have gotten some debris from the Karam Rosenquist contact. Uh, Jim Aiello wrote about that the other day, but man, I, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it was, it was just a really bad day for, for, for Marco. Uh, moving on, you know, a huge shout out to Iowa Speedway, IndyCar, NBC, and every single fan that was there until, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning. I don't even know what time the race ended because I was so tired. Um, but the Iowa Speedway and IndyCar crew to, you know, dry off all the weepers and the, and the track, which was from an insane rainstorm within three or four hours is, uh, you know, Really, really impressive. NBC for their crew for uh, keeping everybody entertained during part of the delay and then coming back and keeping everybody entertained again. And even at when the race ended at, uh, I don't know, let's just say one thirty in the morning central time, there was still a large crowd there. Uh, obviously, the seats weren't filled, but it, it was a pretty good showing. So uh, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, but uh, you know, huge props to everybody involved. Yeah, really good, and I'm glad the Speedway stayed open. I'm really glad they got we got our authentic night race that we were all looking for. So uh, that was super cool, and it's just kind of one of those fun ones where you know you get to stay up late and watch a race and just enjoy your Saturday night. So I really enjoyed it. I agree. It was it was really good of them to all work together and get it done. Um, I also think that we should mention the fans who stayed with the broadcast um, because even though they weren't there, that is way later than most people's bedtime. So I know the numbers were not good, but that was clearly going to happen. But the people who did stick around, I mean, it shows you how how awesome they are as fans. I tweeted something like this. I'm, so, I'm, I'm floored that people were surprised that I got bad ratings. Like, did you think some <laughs> people are going to stick around till one thirty in the, in the 2 Sunday 15, morning? 2.15 in the morning um, <laughs> Eastern time is when it approximately got done. So, yeah. yeah. If, we're, if we're being real, that's where a lot of uh, the viewers will come from in the Indianapolis area. So, the fact that some people are like, oh, my God, I got a point one nine. How the... Heck, can NBC explain that? It's like, well, because the race got delayed four hours. I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but that might have something to do with it. I'm most curious about how the, the re-air on Monday evening went more so than the actual, you know, the actual race. But also a special shout out to a blogger who you can, you can find all of his writing on our website, pitlaneparlay.com. Mike Knapp for getting me uh, from Iowa to my flight. Uh, which was back in Chicago uh, at 7 a.m. Uh, on time. I got to my gate with six minutes to spare uh, so uh, I could get home and enjoy uh, a Sunday at home. Uh, so the big topic of the weekend, which uh, a couple drivers talked about, including Joseph Newgarden on our special episode we uh, released earlier this week, is it time for Iowa to have a repave to present Prevent weepers in the future. 
I think so. I, I think that, you know, what Joseph Newgarden was saying was makes a lot of sense from a driver's point of view and, you know, losing, like, as he said, losing some of that character can be bad for the track and kind of ruin the feel a little bit. But from a fan's point of view, having to worry about weepers is, is pretty lame. I, I'll be honest. It's kind of something that's a little bit of a drag. And he, one of his concerns was about the grip levels. If they repave that the, the second groove and might not be there. I don't know. From when Iowa started in 07, I always thought it was, you know, a two groove track almost immediately. And I think a lot of that has to do with the banking. So I, I would be in favor for a repave, although I have no idea who would pay for it <laughs> if I'm being honest. But to me, from just a fan's point of view, seeing a repave would be nice just to see uh, a smooth track where they're a little closer side by side than normal than what we've been seeing. And then to just in case it does rain to prevent those weepers from happening. I wish I could say that repaving would be the, you know, be all end all answer to the weepers, but unfortunately it not, isn't necessarily the answer. Um, it would be interesting to see, even if they just use that new sealer that they put on IMS, if that would be helpful, um, you know, might be a little more cost effective, but there's no, no way of knowing that re a repave for sure would get rid of the weepers. Um, it would definitely help with them, but I don't know. I just, I can't see it being um, necessarily a good move for the Speedway cost wise. Well, didn't we decide in the Patreon chat that you're now the weeper expert? Is that what happened? Uh, I believe maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I've, I've lost. Maybe. I've lost how many expert teases well, I have now. <laughs> your business card is quite long. Uh, well, kind of on your point though, I wonder what maybe IndyCar should hire you to see if there's a way that we can just eliminate weepers altogether. I don't know if that's a task worth fighting. Maybe. Maybe. I think it's worth it. Hey Jay, if you're listening. <laughs> Question mark. Yes, that's expertise um but yeah the other thing i wanted to bring up real quick before we move on is uh pocono raceway put down some new sort of uh sealant compound uh they're not calling it a repave either similar to ims uh and i read the article and it made my head hurt so i'm not going to try to explain what this compound is but it was the compound then they brought the uh the tire dragon uh over, over over it for i think a couple hours so uh, curious to see if that'll help, you know, Pocono as well. I know there are the NASCAR races there, I think, this weekend. So maybe that'll be a, a good test run. Moving on, just in case, Jess and Matt, you guys didn't know, Scott Dixon is really good. <laughs> I know that's going to be very shocking to you, um, but I will get your thoughts after I say this. Scott Dixon had a terrible car for about 87% of the race, and then he finished in second place. If that's not the definition of Scott Dixon's biography when he retires, I don't know what else will be. Yeah, pretty sure that um, at this point, that's just kind of the story of his season. It's like, wait, where did he come from, and <laughs> how did he finish here? Um, so, very impressive drive. Um, yeah, I... I think I said in our last episode that I didn't expect to see him win. Well, we didn't, but boy, we came close. So um, just insane, insane drive for him. Yeah. And just, it, I mean, we should be surprised, but it's these types of things is the reason that he's won so many championships and races. And it's, it's other things like hitting a piece of debris and, the Karen Rosenquist crash that causes you to go seven laps down. It just makes sense why other drivers seem to not get some of those breaks or the success because some of those breaks just don't fall their way. And it just seems like Dixon, man, they called that strategy so well. And it's like, wow, man, if they can really get a caution, this will really work. And then of course, like three laps later after that I thought came through my head, it, there was a caution. It's like, gosh, this team, like sometimes they just get these breaks that go for them. And for Dixon to stay out there with just really bad tires on a really bad car, to manage to stay in the lead lap while everybody else is on fresh tires was just miraculous. And then, wow, they just caught that lucky break again and, and they just make it work. So it's not really a surprise to Mike's point that Scott Dixon is doing Scott Dixon things, but I, 
it's just one of those things where he just continues to impress the the longer he goes in his career we're still amazed at some of the stuff he does yeah i, I mean Mike, the Mike Hull and Scott Dixon combo has to be up there with like Bill Belichick and Tom Brady in terms of, you know, behind, you know, the, the driver or quarterback. And uh, I don't know how you compare Mike Hull to Bill Belichick, but you get the point. <laughs> I started that one and realized it probably didn't exactly fit, but either way, you, you want to be surprised, but then you're not. So, you know, great job by Scott Dixon. That should be. Uh, we should do that. And be like an episode, like comparing football figures to IndyCar people. Like, yeah. Dale Coyne can be right. Andy Reid. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on, uh, Will Power. Just what looked like a promising podium finish to get his season back on track. Kind of overshoots pit entrance, barely makes it in. Kind of awkwardly on the apron, and then sneaks into pit lane. It's called for improper uh, pit entry, which uh, you know is a penalty. I, I believe Marcus Erickson, if not the same lap, but you know two or three laps before, got called for the exact same thing. So, yeah, you know, I, I hope we see him turn it around. I think we will. But what looked like such a great day, you know, he led forty six laps, and, and just you know, kind of it all went away. And then, of course, he gets terrible timing because the yellow flag comes out. So probably not too much to say on that one. So we'll move on here. Santino Ferrucci, as Jess said, was definitely the uh, social media highlight of the uh, post race with his uh, insane restarts. But the question I'm going to pose for you guys is uh, from a little uh, Twitter tiff that came up afterwards where, uh, you know, Connor Daly said that Ferrucci jumped. Connor Daly spotter says that Ferrucci jumped. But Santino says once the leader goes, it's once the leader goes flat, it's a green flag. And he said some other things. So one, did Santino jump? And two, what is uh, you know, what what's your guys' take on the, you know, restart in question, which I believe was the final restart uh towards the end of the race? He definitely did not jump. Um, the rule is is that once the leader gets to the restart area, which is clearly marked and called out to them, they are the ones who start the race. So if the leader goes, then everybody else can go. Um, so if the leader would have been slow, then he would have he would have jumped. But I don't think he did, and I, I think I think that. Uh, Connor was, you know, just a little frustrated with the situation because he probably could have done the same thing and kind of missed out on it. Yeah, I think it's a classic case of he was hating on the player instead of hating on the game. I think Santino did nothing wrong. I think he actually timed it perfectly. It, it brought me back to the days of Thomas Schechter, to be honest. It was super cool to watch his restarts and seeing him just pass a multitude of cars on the high line. It was really awesome to see. But yeah, I think Connor's frustrations were kind of um, taken out in a, in a way to maybe express some frustrations with the restarts there at the end and maybe getting caught at the bottom uh, while Ferrucci was taking advantage on the high side. But I don't think uh, what Ferrucci did at all was in any way wrong and, or I don't think he broke any rules per se. I'm going to agree with both of you. So I don't really have too much to add here other than I, you know, listen, I understand there's some, you know, backstory to Connor, not particularly being a fan of Santino and that's all, you know, that's fine. We're not going to, we're going to play, we're not going to play gossip school here, but uh, I don't think Ferrucci did anything at all and wrong at all. And I'm, I'm going to leave it there. He had a hell of a race. It's, it's a shame that Ferrucci didn't get a top 10 finish because he probably passed more cars than, than most of the other guys out there. So moving on, Sage Karam. I know we, we touched on him a couple minutes ago. Didn't really have the best of races. You know, had that spin early on that, thankfully, Felix Rosenquist was able to recover from and then uh, wasn't able to get out of the way when uh, Takuma Sato was, had to get out of the throttle for uh, whatever reason. But... You know, definitely a frustrating day for Karam, who kind of felt like he was getting some momentum after uh, a decent Toronto showing. 
Uh, do you guys think at this point we uh, have seen the last of Sage for 2019, or, or do you think he'll pop back in for at least another race? Tough to tell. I think his only hope, honestly, is Gateway, given that Kimball's in the second Carlin car for for Carlin that race, unless for some reason they decide to throw him in the Gallagher car, which I guess isn't out of the question. And it all Can really I- depends on showing back up. So I, it was a bummer to see those incidents because I know that does hurt his chances for the future. It wasn't his best weekend. I thought once the, you know, once he calmed down there, I thought his race pace was fine, but it was just the incidents that kind of caught him out there. Yeah. I have to say, I don't see him back this year. I feel like, um, you know, with the way Carlin's been kind of doing everything this year, I feel like they may try to, go a different route just to see. Um, I almost feel like they're using it as a test car, which we kind of talked about before. So we might see somebody different uh, get get a chance at this point and, and just see kind of how they shake out. Yeah, Matt, I just want to correct that Kimball is in for Pocono in the, uh, in the other car. What did I say? Gateway. Whoops. Either way, just so everybody out there doesn't get confused. Yeah, you know, and Pocono would be the one race, you know, because it's his local race that you would think Karam might get a chance. But since it's already on on Charlie's calendar, uh, I don't, I don't see, you know, maybe. But but I think I, I agree with Jess here that they're going to use that car as a as a test car. So wrap wrap up our uh, Iowa discussion. I almost called it Toronto again. Uh, I don't know what what weekend it is anymore. Huge props to the Foyt guys, like I mentioned. And uh, a quick recap of our predictions. I think we were... Oh, Matt didn't really have a great day. Matt Wait, pre- what? Erickson was doing fine until that penalty. Yeah, well, well, he got a penalty. Uh, your, your, <laughs> your bad pick was bad, uh, or good. Um, so you were right on that one. Jess, Jess hit a home run uh, with Santino doing well and Marco doing not so well. Uh, I picked Rossi to do well. I think he did decent, and my bad picks was pick was Rosenquist who kind of had an uninspiring day but not really a bad day so I think Jess wins this round hang on a second Erickson beat Santino though well you know that's besides the point (laughs) what (laughs) but Erickson went backwards and Santino he was running like eighth until the penalty and the Santino had flashy restarts but at the end of the day Santino passed like 93,000 cars in one race but Erickson passed him at the end which is what counts the most (laughs) more than the 93,000 ever takes I'm gonna call it a tie between (laughs) Jeff I'll take that I'll I'll take a tie Um, but Rossi won anyway so I guess that's fair Quick shout out to uh, our Patreon followers. I'm going to start having to trim down this list here uh, each week, but thank you, uh, Colin Taylor. Thank you, uh, Darcy Bretz. Also, uh, happy wedding anniversary. Uh, thank you to David Lighting, uh, our buddy George, and everybody's favorite Xbox racer, Jake Neely. Oh, man. <laughs> Wow. I don't even know if I can follow that up now. I'm going to try, though. I'm going to try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make you guys laugh. I'm going to have a little fun because it is time for Jess's Joker lap. So this week, just to kind of, you know, if we have a new listener, we three here, we like, we like the food a lot. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Mike Knapp and Fong's Pizza in Iowa. That stuff was amazing. Yeah, Shout out so, to Mike Knapp. So we just we just like food. We talk about food a lot. Uh, we talk about drinky drinks a lot. Um, so I, I'm going to make you guys a chef this week. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, I like to cook. Okay, so I want you guys to come up with your perfect track food. And also your perfect track drink, both adult beverage and, you know, regular beverage, because this is a family friendly program. Man. Well, I only know how to cook like 10 things, if I'm being honest. So I don't, I don't know if you want to hire me, anybody out there. Jay Fry, please do not hire me as a caterer. (laughs) Man, are we allowed to cater from the outside or do we have to like cook from scratch? No, no, no. You just, you can just put whatever you want together. I mean, you don't have to cook it yourself. Oh, well then happy days. I'm bringing Raising Cane's to the track. hundred percent. I think 
if I was a team hosting sponsors and whatnot, and I had Raising Cane's with their Texas toast and their their sauce and the obviously the chicken strips there, fries, I think I would sign 55 sponsors a weekend, maybe. I mean, if, if team wants That's, to try, let me know the success. Let me know how that goes. That That is very high hopes there. Okay, and then what about your adult beverage? Adult beverage would be... I don't know. I don't. Can I be like? Can I be lame and say that my adult beverage of choice is Dr. McGillicuddy's mixed with Red Bull? Is that super strange? I know people out there judge. That's fine. Or a nice spotted cow on tap. Okay. That would be all right. That'd be super cool. And if not alcoholic, I would say Sunny D. Because why not? All right. Well, I'm gonna. Be I like, just I'm, got I know. I'm like a ten, just thinking about that. Okay. I'm like a ten year old. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So food wise, wow. I'm I'm actually struggling with this one, but I think I don't know if there's one that's better than the other, but uh something and any place that makes tacos. Tacos uh like authentic tacos, like the onions and cilantro or like, you know, like Americanized tacos. Just it can be anything except Taco Bell. Yeah, okay. All right. But Anyway, so we're going to leave track food as tacos. Uh, my non-alcoholic beverage, I'm going to go with something to keep you hydrated while you are in uh, the heat because most of the races are in the summer. And if you were in Iowa, you were probably melting to the grandstands. <laughs> uh, so something like Gatorade would, would be nice. My adult beverage, uh, since the day, well, when we started recording this episode, it was still National Tequila Day. I'm going to go with a Paloma, which is tequila, lime juice, and uh, grapefruit, sometimes with like a little bit of Sprite or Fresca mixed in there. Well, that's way more sophisticated than mine. Yeah, well, I like... <laughs> Don't say it. <laughs> I like the drinks. <laughs> so, um, and I am a huge fan of Palomas, so they are uh, a very nice, light, summery, alcoholic beverage. Wait, so you know how uh, Rossi and Hinch have that debate of if a hot dog is a sandwich? Yes. yes. Is a tortilla a type of bread? Yes. Yes. So then wouldn't, make, wouldn't tacos technically be sandwiches then? Oh, boy. All right, that's our poll of the week. Is a taco a sandwich? <laughs> Man. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how to answer this. I, I honestly am completely stumped right now. Well, we have to start with the premise of is a hot dog a sandwich? And if you say yes to that, then you have to ponder... Is a taco a sandwich? I would say. I mean, like, I think a hot dog is a sandwich depending yes. on what you put on it. I mean, like, just a plain like, hot dog in a bun. I don't think that's really a sandwich. I'm a lame American, and I put cheese on mine. I think I'm. I don't know of too many people. Does anybody put cheese on their hot dog out there? If you do, let me know. I just want to feel like I'm not the only person in the world that does that. Please tell me. Is it like a slice of American cheese that you peel the plastic wrapper off of and yes, slap it on a, there? It's a craft single. <laughs> I told you already. I am 10. <laughs> <laughs> I have one every week. Oh, man. I love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't like that bougie cheese that people get out there. I just go with the craft single. Bougie method. cheese. We, like, just, we just stepped into the bougie cheese, guys. <laughs> give me a 400-pound block of craft singles, and we're good. <laughs> so all my all my gouda and all that is is bougie. No, cheese. yeah, just give me some singles. <laughs> I am changing Matt's name in my phone as soon as we get done recording to bougie, to bougie cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Matt bougie cheese hickey. Oh, that's not that does not ring well. You, you have no first and last name now. Oh um, my! Oh, I'll just be Matt bougie cheese. That works too. Um, well, if we do like shirts ever, and we all like have personalized personalized one, we can have. Host Mike, we can have Jess, the expert of ins- everything, <laughs> ins- thing here, and then we can have Matt Bougie Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> but no, we got to conclude this Joker lap, though. All right, Jess, we've presented <laughs> our things. Which hospitality tent are you going to go to? I am. I'm. I'm so. I'm. I've got to go with Mike on this one. I got Sunny D. <laughs> can't do the sunny d it kind of makes me want to yak and um the taco <laughs> the, Red Bull. <laughs> the, the tacos and the palomas is where it's at so that's where i'm gonna go <laughs> <laughs> jeez 
this all escalated really fast. I like it. Hey, and I don't like I don't like uh, American cheese. So that's where no, that there's is. There's gonna be no singles American. <laughs> that's not very authentic canes. No bougie cheese in this. No, house. no, I do like I do like no, bougie cheese. I don't. Like- the bougie cheese. <laughs> I go to Road America and I see Sargento signs everywhere, and I'm super confused. Oh man, <laughs> yeah. you're killing me. <laughs> Matt, your mother has not raised you correctly. <laughs> oh. Shout out, to, shout out to the Hickey parents. They are the friendliest people I have ever met at a racetrack. Yeah, they're they're awesome. Don't worry. She did good, I think, other than maybe the cheese. Well, actually, when uh, we do breakfast at their place, they actually make me bring a single because they're above that. So, Jess, you would appreciate that. <laughs> I actually bring my own cheese because uh, so embarrassing. I'm super lame like that. We might have to, you know, since we are like known for cheese talk we may need to work on your um like like let's expand your horizons a little bit with the cheese maybe not like totally bougie but (laughs) like you know grown-up cheese coming soon to pit lane parlay patreon episode mike (laughs) and jess have a cheese intervention with (laughs) matt bougie cheese hickey i feel like you're on like some episode like some law and order episode of like (laughs) Oh, man. oh wow okay well guys i did not expect the uh, joker lab to be quite that entertaining but thank you all for that so moving <laughs> right along i'm gonna jump into stump to host because i've also got that tonight and i just i get to just really torture you all so i think that we can agree that this weekend foy racing had a we'll, we'll call it a decent weekend yes yeah See? okay so I am going to talk about point racing in the stump the host. And I'm going to ask you the last time they won something or did something and who the driver was. Okay. I got 13 Long Beach. Okay. Well, that was one of them. So good job. Uh, how about the last time they won a championship? Breck 98. All right. He doesn't even give me a chance to, to enter the <laughs> conversation here. This is, this is oh, I knew there was a Kenny Brack answer coming. I just know the, yeah. I know the person. It started with Brack. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> okay. And then how about the last time they got a podium? 2014. Negative. 2015. Correct. And who was the driver? Sato. Yep. And do you know where? That's like a bonus question because I... Pocono? I'm, no. St. Pete? No. Mike, you oh. want to guess? <laughs> Since he won't let you talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this is the worst stump the host ever. Matt By the is, way, this is what he does to me all the time. So, I, just- Mike, I've done two right. <laughs> like, you can feel free to get one right here. This is what Matt... Uh, this is what I have done in, well, what I used to do in stump the host and just dominate the question. No, if it was you, you'd be like <laughs> contemplating the entire schedule before you answered. Out loud. I'm going to go with Houston. Negative. It was Detroit race number two. But good job. You got the, you guys got the driver in the year. So good job on that. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, By this, you guys one, me. this one's a given. This is the last one because I, you guessed the last win before I even asked the question. Um, so how about the last win at the Indy 500? Oof. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I, I, I go ahead, just go ahead, Matt. You got Brack 90, 99. Yes, 99. <laughs> I, I was about to say 97. But I, know. I know you almost screwed it up right there. Uh, All right, good job, good job, good job. You, you got everything except what race, uh, Sato podium at. So good job, Mike. Did I get a prize? Some bougie cheese. <laughs> please please priority mail me some bougie cheese overnight. Uh, pit lane parlay sticker. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, stuff you, on a piece of bougie cheese. <laughs> you guys, you guys, no, yeah, put it on a singles wrapper and send that to me. That'll be. You know, if he mailed you a single, it probably would still be edible by the time it got there. <laughs> he is. He is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And just in case my fridge dies, my cheese will be good in the morning. Okay, <laughs> just remember that. <laughs> oh my gosh, we need to get some mid Ohio here. Yeah, Mid Ohio is this weekend. Really looking forward to it. I, I'm 99 percent sure the race is on NBC, so that's uh, hopefully we get some good ratings out of that. Correct. The uh, top four in the championship, as you know, Mike mentioned earlier about the gaps, is New Garden, 
followed by Rossi, Pagano, and Dixon. Uh, as we said, kind of after Toronto, that Powers, you know, not really in the hunt anymore. And then after Iowa, it's almost a, a certainty that he's not really in the hunt anymore. Uh, the last year's top five from the race was Rossi, followed by Wickens, Power, Newgarden, and Dixon. It was one of the best races we saw in 2018. We did discuss that in our review show with Jim Aiello at the end of the season, how good uh, Mid Ohio w- was. So I guess the simple question to start out is, do you guys think we will see the same type of race this year as far as Mid-Ohio being another one where there's a lot of overtaking and some pretty good drama? I don't see why not. Uh, you know, the, the natural road courses this year have produced some great racing, and uh, Mid-Ohio was great last year. There has, I don't think there's anything changing this year other than maybe the tire compound by a little bit, but unless it's a thousand degrees or pouring rain, I think we're going to see a fantastic race again. Heck yes. We're going to see a good race. You got to think these guys are, are fighting for their, their season now. And they're, they're really in the, in the thick of things. And I think we're going to see some really, really close racing this weekend. Yeah, I agree. And I am going to be completely honest. I've always been a, I wouldn't say hater, not been the biggest fan of mid Ohio, and last year really changed my opinion, if I'm being honest. So now, unfortunately, I kind of have high expectations for the race. So hopefully, I, th- I think the race will deliver, but fingers crossed it, it it's another good show. Uh, so that's really cool. And it's such a good turnout. The fans there are going to be, you know, great per usual. Uh, Mike will be there. Uh, a couple other of our Patreon members will be there too, but Mike will be there Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't fly until late Friday night. So I'll be at the track Saturday and Sunday this weekend. Okay, so cool. So if you see him in his nap coming? No, I'm I'm uh, I'm solo this weekend. All right. Well, shout out to Mike for holding down the fort. Good luck with everything. Uh, predictions, good and struggle. We'll start with good. Who do you guys think is going to do really well this weekend? Uh, I'm going to go with the Dale Coin cars. Sebastian Bourdais had a, you know, he was passing everybody left and right last year after starting last. I think he's going to be able to transfer some of that knowledge to the restart master Santino Ferrucci uh, and they will have a very, both of them will have a, a good day. I'm going to go kind of left field here. I'm going to say Jack Harvey. I mean, he's, he's done well in the races that he's done this year. And I, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to go total gut feeling on, on both of my picks for this one. Good to have uh, Jack Harvey back. It's been a couple of weeks and I know this race for them is super important. It's kind of like their home race. Plus, uh, who else? Like Graham Rahal, Zach Veach, a couple other drivers. I don't know if they have close connections to Ohio, but that should be something to keep an eye on. I'm trying to find a non-Penske driver to pick. Pick Rahal. I could, yeah, sure. I'll go Graham Rahal. Why not? The hometown guy. He's uh, done pretty well a bit, Ohio. I'm trying to look at his prior driver ratings there and yeah, pretty good. So I think he's in for a solid weekend. He's been solid at the, Natural road courses this year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Road America and Barber and Grand Prix, I think he's done fine at. So uh, look for him to have a solid weekend for sure, hopefully. Uh, what about struggles? I'm going to go with Ray Hall's teammate in Takuma Sato. Didn't really have a great race at Mid-Ohio last year. Uh, I don't, I'm not looking at his, I'm not cheating and looking at his his career there. Uh, only because it won't load on my computer right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, you <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's, he's kind of hit a little bit of a rut the last few weeks, whether it's, you know, been his fault or not. But uh, so my pick will be Sato. Uh, well, like I said, this week, I'm, I'm totally playing off gut feelings here. So I could be way off, but that usually works better for me than when I think about it. Um, so I'm going to go with Ed Jones. Obviously, he's been struggling. He's had some incidents that made me question him very strongly. Um, I just, I just think he is maybe got a little bit too much pressure on his shoulders right now, or something, and he's just struggling. So I, I think he's gonna have a rough weekend. I really want to say Marco, but I shouldn't. <laughs> um, you know, he's gonna get a podium now that you said that. No. <laughs> Oh, we got a lot of jokes tonight. Let's see here. I mean, gosh, I should almost like 
shave my head if Marco gets a podium or something. I really don't want to, though. I shouldn't have said that. No, you sh- you have to do it now. Like, there's no backing out of that. You're going to be contacting your wife to hold to make sure that this happens. Sounds good. All right. You guys get on that. I'm going to go with Max Chilton simply because it's never been a good scene for him at Mid-Ohio. Never really gone his way and not really had the best year either. Good to see him back, though, uh, for the road course. But, yeah, I don't see him having the best of times unless those Penske shocks really end up being the difference maker for him in the natural road courses, too. Uh, one interesting topic to discuss with when it comes to specifically mid Ohio more than other tracks, uh, especially on the back of what we saw last year. Uh, for those who uh, don't remember last year quite vividly, uh, Alexander Rossi opted for a two stop strategy and made it really work really well. Um, with that, you have to be a little more conservative on the fuel and your tires get, you know, worn a little quicker because they have a long, you have to go longer on them. Whereas guys like Wickens and a couple guys behind Wickens ended up doing a three-stop strategy where you get to burn more fuel, go a little faster, use your tires a little more aggressively, but then you have to make that extra pit stop. And so it seems like mid-Ohio, we get that a lot. I know Charlie Kimball won that year, and I think it was 2013, where he went for the three-stop strategy and actually worked great for him. So as far as personal preference for you two, uh, do you guys have a preference on if you you see guys doing that two-stop conservative strategy or kind of the gutsy three-stop strategy? I'd go three. I mean, you can go all out the whole race. Um, it, it gives you a little uh, boost of confidence there at the end that you've got better tires and you've got more fuel so you don't have to save anything. Um, so I just think it it gives them a little bit of breathing room. I think if you're going to do the two-stop strategy, it has to be somebody like Alex Rossi or Scott Dixon, who uh, is you know very good at saving fuel and and you know managing tires. Uh, you probably can't do a two-stop strategy if you're a rookie, just because you simply don't have the experience. Not saying that they're not capable, but you know this this that stuff takes time. So I, I agree with Jess, but the two-stop strategy, if 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 you can make it work, is is very good. Yeah, I got a kind of foot in both camp. I think the the three stop works great if you start on the primaries and then pit within like the first five laps, go out on the reds, get clean air, and try to jump as many people you, as you can on the cycle. That seems to work pretty well for some guys. And I, just the only worry with the three stop is the the appearance of a caution could really throw a wrench in things and kind of send you to the back. So I see both sides. I think what Rossi did last year was just superb. So I think the winner of the race, you know, barring a million cautions, I think may end up doing that two-stop strategy. But it is something that's fascinating going to mid-Ohio that it seems like it always works out that way to decide what might be a better option for people. And one more thing to touch on as far as our mid-Ohio preview, it's good to see R.C. Enerson back. He is going to be driving the number 31 Carlin car that has been occupied by a host of drivers this season, including Pato O'Ward and uh, Sage Karam. So he's going to be driving with Lucas Oil Schools on the side of his car. Personally speaking, looking back at his history, he's his, he's made an IndyCar start at Mid-Ohio and did very well in Dale, with Dale Coyne in 2016. And then in Indy Lights, he actually did really well at Mid-Ohio. Well, I believe he will, may have won a race, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe that was Pro Mazda. It's kind of escaping me at the moment. But it seems like he's done really well at Mid-Ohio in the past. So what are your guys' thoughts on R.C. Enerson returning to IndyCar, this time with Carlin Racing? Yeah, uh, super happy for R.C. Uh, Matt, you were correct. He did win win, win at Mid-Ohio in Indy Lights uh, in 2015. And even going back to his USF 2000 at Mid-Ohio, uh, he finished third both years he was in F2000. So he's, he's had a pretty good track record there. If I remember correctly to his Dale coin uh, start, it wasn't an amazing finish finishing 19th, but I think he had a, you know, a good qualifying effort or a couple good practices. Uh, you know, he, he definitely put on a good show. So I think, uh, I think, you know, we'll see him do pretty well there. I'm glad after, you know, he got the preseason test that he's actually able to get in a race this year. I know he had the preseason test, and and I'm not going to knock him, but I'm a little concerned with the lack of seat time 
um, how it's going to turn out. I hope, I hope he does well. I hope he um, has a nice learning race because honestly, that's, that's kind of, you know, the, the best hope for him is, is he gets uh, some seat time and he gets to learn more about the car. Um, really looking forward to seeing that car on track. It looks really nice. Um, I, I hope he does well. I really do. I, I just am a little concerned um, with the lack of seat time, uh, how he's going to handle that. Yeah, so good luck to RC, and uh, should be a really fun weekend at Mid Ohio. And again, if you see Mike, say hello. Yes, please. And real quick before we get to everybody's favorite segment of the week, shout out to actually one of RC's uh, sponsors. I think the sticker was on his helmet at some point in the past couple of years. SoundQ Audio. Uh, they're back with us. Uh, if you go to soundqaudio.com and use promo code PLP35 at checkout, you get 35% off your order. So uh, thanks to them for jumping back on board. And now, guys. And now it's time for Pit Lane Parlay's Pitfalls of the Week. And thanks again, Andy, for coming up with that lovely jingle. Uh, we'll have to get a Joker lap one going soon. Jess, why don't you start us off? All right. So mine is going to have to be Dragon Speed Racing. Well, I'm not really sure if it, I should fault them or the United States government. I don't know which it is, um, who's, who's at fault more. Uh, but they are unfortunately not going to be at Mid-Ohio like originally planned because their visas didn't come through for some of their crew guys and I believe also for Ben Hanley. I mean, come on, guys. This is like you, you know you have to have it done. You know you have to have it done by a certain date. Like, how did this fall through the cracks? And, like, I don't, I just don't even know what else to say. How did this fall through the cracks? Like, what were you guys thinking? Um, I mean, you know how paperwork gets delayed anyways. So, it's it's kind of disappointing that, that a team would let something like that happen. Um, hopefully, they'll get that taken care of and we'll see them before the year is out. But I'm just disappointed in them. Yeah, it's not, it's not the first time we've seen the issue, too, which is kind of strange. Um, didn't the Mikhail Lotion kind of have something like that where he, he couldn't come back? Yeah, he did. He I think it was like almost the same thing. Like he couldn't get his paperwork through, which I, that was all during. Well, I don't even know. But that yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there was Simona, too, in 2011. She couldn't get back to Sonoma in time because of visa issues, so Pagano had to jump in her car, too. So, yeah, it's it's bizarre how these things happen kind of randomly. Yeah, you would think that once you had it, you were good for, I don't know, a year or whatever, but obviously that's not the case. But they should have known that ahead of time and been thinking about that ahead of time. But I don't know. That's just my opinion. All right, Matt, go ahead. Mine's going to be, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but mine's going to be uh, Will Power for the second straight week. And again, you know, as Mike recapped, he had a pretty pretty brutal mistake coming into the pits and ended up getting a penalty for it, which, you know, cost him at least a top five, but more likely a podium finish at Iowa. And it's just, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if he just feels the pressure from Rossi, um, you know, breathing down his seat if he's worried that Rossi might take it, which... Uh, Bruce Martin came out with an article today saying that Rossi was potentially going to stay at Andretti. So I think he, he just needs to kind of take a step back and just try to, you know, get at least one or two wins out of these final six races, which he's more than capable of doing. But to see these type of uncharacteristic self-inflicted mistakes from Will Power is, is really uncanny, uh, especially for a driver who's been so consistent the last couple of years. So it's kind of disappointing to see these mistakes reoccurring, but you know, I have full faith that he'll recover, uh, and Mid Ohio is going to be a really good track for him to to kind of start what hopefully is the last you know good third of the season for him. But yeah, I was really disappointed to see his mistake there, and uh, really cost him and his team a really good result. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I think we'll see Will turn it around. He's you know he's he had a good race minus one minor mistake, so. Uh, the, the race craft is still there. He hasn't forgotten how to race. But I have two here. I have a pit win and a pitfall. My pitfall is a late addition, as as Jess knows, while well, Matt was getting uh, his technical issues resolved before we started recording. But my pit win is going to be the Iowa fans that stuck around through uh, an insane rain delay and thunderstorm. And it looked like the 
uh, Iowa Speedway was going to get carried away in a river at one point. Uh, and you know, by the time the race started, there was a, g- a good crowd and they suffered through an, another rain delay, you know, partway through the race that wasn't too bad. So uh, huge props, you know, like I said earlier in the episode for everybody who uh, stuck around there. I had to add a pitfall because, uh, <laughs> well, this time it wasn't Rich Energy, but it was the team that maybe they're, they still sponsor. You know, we sort can- of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know where that stands. Uh, William Story will probably tweet again a hundred more times to tell us over the weekend. Haas came out to Haas Racing came out today and said they won't design their 2020 F1 car to fit Pirelli's tires. <laughs> I, I, Are you kidding me? <laughs> thank you to Motorsport.com and writer Scott Mitchell for writing this because if you. <laughs> the look on my face right now uh gunther gunther steiner said we cannot make the car to fit the tires then next year the tire is going to change and you're back to square one (laughs) i mean i said this like a couple weeks ago this is like one i haven't heard about this today so this is like breaking news to me i guys what everybody listening if you can please help make sense of this maybe i'm missing something easy (laughs) but I also like the fact that he said in here, the strange thing is we don't have a bad car. It's about how we react. <laughs> I mean, that's partially true. You do have Roman Grosjean as one of your drivers. <laughs> he never reacts well. Uh, but uh, you have a bad car if it doesn't work with the tires. Uh, just kind of adding two plus two there equals bad. God, I uh, Honestly, I don't know if Jess has any I- input here, but I, I, I'm just going to pitfall that the, the article, it's not the article itself, uh, but the topic itself, because it's, and there's a lot of laughable F1 stuff going on right now. I feel like they are going to cut a small hole in the bottom of their car, and it's going to be like the Flintstones, because if the tires don't fit, then how the heck else are they supposed to drive? Can somebody please Photoshop that? <laughs> we'll just have the uh, brain trust at Rich Energy do it for us. Oh, yep. yeah, good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, and with that, yeah, thank you everybody again for listening this week. Uh, we'll be back with a Harding Steinbrenner episode on Tuesday when I talk to somebody at the track there. We will have at least one or two interviews uh, in addition to uh, post in a special episode. And uh, thank you again to Gritmap for coming on board as our presenting sponsor. So with that, Jess, go ahead and sign us off. And guys, keep your lug nuts tight. Here is the racecast weather forecast for the Honda Indy 200 at Mid-Ohio. I'm meteorologist Doug Schneider. High pressure over Ohio through the week will start to shift east over the weekend. This will bring warming temperatures and increasing humidity through the event. Saturday will be a nice day for racing with mostly sunny skies, high temperatures in the mid-80s, and a southwest wind at 5 to 10 miles an hour. No rain is expected on Saturday. Sunday, we'll have a slightly better chance of seeing some rain, but the chance of rain is still quite low. Afternoon heating may lead to some isolated showers or thunderstorms in the mid-Ohio area, but the chance of one hitting the track is only about 20%. Most of the day will be mostly sunny, with high temperatures in the upper 80s, with humidity levels making it feel closer to 90 degrees. Winds will be from the southwest at 5 to 10 miles an hour. For the most up-to-date forecast and weather updates through the race, Visit racecastweather.com and follow RacecastWX on Twitter.